we are uh, one of the largest uh, and fastest growing uh, technology companies which play purely in healthcare. Uh, we've got around 5,000 employees uh, today um, and also consulting, of course. And, and we're growing really, really fast. So, so, so you know, uh, you will hear a lot about us in the months and years to come. Um, the forum today is uh, going to be paneled by uh, you know, two of our leaders. Uh, I'll make those introductions. Eric Schultz and uh, Farooq Muna. Uh, so Eric is uh, uh, the executive vice president of Cities Tech and the president of Fluid Edge Consulting, which is a Cities Tech company. Uh, Eric's got uh, an extremely, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know prestigious uh, career uh, where he was the president and CEO of Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare and before that the CEO of Falm Health, uh, which are really leading players uh, in the U.S. healthcare industry. Uh, uh, he he has been with us for the last three years, and his role has primarily been to drive uh, strategy and drive business development uh, more from the consulting side of things. Uh, Farooq is uh, one of our senior leaders who leads the uh, digital engineering proficiency at City District. Uh, Farooq's mandate is basically to move ahead with all next generation technology as it applies to healthcare. So so he leads all new technology and emerging technology areas for sitting state. Thanks, Sujay. And uh, uh, hello, Farooq. Good to be on this panel with you and, and welcome to everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Schultz, as Sujay introduced. Um, I am speaking to you from the state of Maine in the US, which is about 100 uh, kilometers north of Boston, Massachusetts. And um, I love how technology can bring us together uh, so seamlessly. So let me first say welcome everyone. My understanding is those who are joining us today are individuals who have accepted an opportunity with Sidious Tech and will be joining us in the near term. And I'm really excited to know that you've selected this opportunity and we'll be very excited to have you join our organization. It's a great organization. One, one typo I noticed on the slide is it said that I joined the organization in 19. Actually, I joined the organization at the end of last year. So I can remember exactly how you all are feeling right now as you're getting ready to um, move on to your next profession. Let me tell you one thing. Um, whatever position I took in my career, I wanted to make sure I was moving to a position that gave me new opportunities to expand my professional portfolio and uh, second, to really make a difference in the healthcare system. And, and last is to work in an organization where the values are positive, where I enjoyed being, because we spend so much time at work and we want to work with people who share our values. And when I um, was thinking about my next career opportunity after leaving Harvard Pilgrim, which I was proud to say, we were the number one health plan in the United States for 10 years in a row. I wanted to move into an organization that made a difference in healthcare and also an organization that had the culture and the values that I feel are so important. And that uh, was the reason it was so easy for me to move to Sidious Tech. It's a great company and I know that you're going to experience that when you join us. What you're going to see right away is there's an incredible confluence of what's going on in the U.S. healthcare system and what Sidious Tech is all about in Fluid Edge Consulting and SDLC, a company we recently required. Uh, so we're very well positioned. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, thanks. Uh, we're calling this presentation, this webinar, The Final Frontier. And frankly, if some of you got on this call a little earlier, you heard us talking about it. The healthcare industry, and this is not just the US, uh, but many countries which I have visited and studied the healthcare, is it's the last major system to embrace technology to change how we deliver care and how we provide health insurance. And uh, it has been very, very slow over the last number of decades, but we're starting to see an inflection point. And I believe the inflection point is going to be steeply up, meaning the rate of change and the type of change is going to be rather dramatic. Um, you know, uh, another good thing, and I have two sons that are both in healthcare, and I've always advised uh, young people that healthcare industry is a great industry to be in because it's recession proof. Everyone needs healthcare, everyone needs health insurance. And so no matter what happens in um, our economy, 
the health care is going to be required. Um, the other thing that I would say, and I mentioned briefly, is that the work that we're doing at Sidious Tech and at Fluid Edge Consulting is services that we're providing to a broad swath of who's in the healthcare system, physicians, hospitals, uh, pharmacy, um, you know, health insurance and, and uh, technology companies. So it's a very broad swath of actors, if you will, that are in the healthcare system. So let's go to the next page. All right, if I could ask you, take, let's go right to the bottom of this page. What I want to uh, mention here, are what are the challenges in the U.S. healthcare system today? If you look at the bottom, in the middle column, you can see how much money is being spent per person on healthcare in the world. It's about 1,250 U.S. dollars. In the U.S., it's almost $11,000. Now, I will tell you, the amount of money being spent on healthcare in the U.S., is more than it should be. There is a lot of waste in the U.S. healthcare system today for a variety of reasons, but uh, that number should be lower and the quality of care uh, should be better than what we've got today. So there's an opportunity for much improvement. Uh, let's go to the top of the slide. What are some of the challenges? First is access. Access to care in the U.S. broadly it is getting worse where we have growth in populations in urban areas. The uh, amount of care or the providers of care is decreasing for a variety of reasons. So we have a, a shortage, if you will. We also have an aging population. This is something we're seeing across the world. Um, more and more people or a greater percentage of our population is over the age of 65. And the older we get as a population, the more demands we have for health care, for pharmaceutical um, care, and, and the like. Interestingly, and this is especially unique in the United States, the buyer behavior, we're high demanders of care in the U.S. We want care, we think we know what we want, and we want it now. And the interesting thing in the U.S. is when we pursue and get all of this care, we know what we want, but we don't know what the price of it is. And we're actually, as consumers, not responsible for paying for those services. It's going to be covered under insurance, which I'll touch on next. So, you know, think about it. Um, in anything you all do today, if you go out shopping and you want to buy something and it doesn't matter what the price is, you just pick out what you want and let the insurance pay for the item. You can see how the buyer behavior gets a little bit different than what we're used to. And then the other challenge is the healthcare system in the U.S. is very siloed. You have physician group practices or healthcare systems of hospitals and doctors together. They're very separate from another healthcare system that may be in the same city and they don't talk to each other. And so we're very siloed. And even though we use technology, perhaps in each of these entities, the technologies don't speak to each other. So it's very inefficient. And we have a lot of duplication of services, frankly, because one system doesn't speak to the next. So moving on to the next page. Um, on the next two pages, let me just touch on how the US healthcare system is a little bit more unique or different from other areas in the world. First of all, insurance is king. And we say that because most people in the United States have insurance. And 50% uh, of the population get insurance from their employer. Their employer pays for the majority of it. And then you as an employee pay for a percentage of that health insurance. And once you have health insurance, when you go to the doctors or if you go to the hospital, whatever, your insurance company pays that provider for the care. So you, everyone needs to have health insurance. And um, just to give you some quick numbers, 50% have health insurance through their employer. Uh, another 20% have health insurance because they're over 65 and it's um, Medicare for older people retired. Uh, another 20% have what we call Medicaid. It's a medical aid 
it's really for those people who are at a certain poverty level or below. And so it's free insurance, health insurance for the poor. And then there's about 8% of the U.S. population that has no health insurance at all. And we call that they're going bare. They really run the risk of losing their life savings if they have to be hospitalized and it costs $100,000, which is not a large price for um, an admission to a hospital. So insurance is definitely king. You better have it. You better get it. Um, the government will pay for insurance after you retire. And the government will pay for insurance if you are poor. Now, emergency rooms, this is kind of interesting. If you go to an emergency room here in the U.S., when you go in, whether you have insurance or not, you're generally going to be covered. They'll cover the services right then and there. They won't turn anyone away. I mean, if you go in with a mosquito bite or something like that, that's not, that's not an issue. But more and more emergency rooms have been providing services because of laws that prevent emergency rooms from turning people away. However, if you don't fall below a certain poverty level and you have no insurance, you're going to have to pay for that bill. And a typical emergency room visit is uh, somewhere in the $5,000 U.S. range, U.S. dollar range. So it's a big, big, uh, you know, uh, bill. You can try to negotiate a discount if you pay it off fast, but it's, it's tough. Now, what role does the government play in insurance? You heard me say the government will fund Medicare when you're retired, and the government will fund Medicaid if you fall below a certain poverty level. The other thing the government does here in the United States, and this happens more and more, is they set rules or regulations on how insurance companies should work. And they also incentivize insurance companies to do different things to help improve outcomes and lower the medical cost trend. So that's that's a quick touch on the U.S. healthcare system. So, uh, Eric, if you don't mind, I'll just ask a quick question here. Sure. Uh, so you spent many years in the healthcare industry, in the insurance industry of healthcare. You know? So, uh, in your mind, how has it changed in the last several years, and and uh, how do you anticipate it to change in the future? Sure. I, you know, honestly, in the last twenty plus years, the change hasn't been that great. Other than the cost of insurance has gone up. Right. And employers typically are asking their employees to pay for a higher percentage of that insurance, right? It used to be employers paid for the whole thing. Now they're paying anywhere from 50 to 70% of the insurance premium. But the changes that I see as we go forward really has to do with the role technology will play around data and analytics and around interoperability. Insurance companies now have many incentives uh, to create an experience for those customers, their insureds, uh, to have a more seamless experience, to give consumers control in their hand. I've got my cell phone right here. I can buy my insurance, pick out for me what I can use, artificial intelligence that knows what will be best for me and my family for insurance. Um, and we can remove a lot of the... Um, annoying obstacles that are in place right now for consumers around healthcare. And so it's it's really technology driven. And that's why I came to Cities Tech because as a health insurance CEO, one thing I knew, any major strategy that we developed in our company required an investment in technology to move us forward. So uh, that's why I'm glad to be here at Cities Tech because we're gonna be at the heart of all of it. Good question, thanks Farouk. Uh, next page. In the U.S., pharmaceutical companies, also we call them life sciences, they are a huge and growing force. Number one, um, the U.S. population consumes a lot of medicine, uh, more than they really need, honestly. Uh, the culture here is that if you're sick, you got to get a medicine or a pill uh, for it because they think, you know, this is what we need to get better. But the big pharma is very wealthy industry. They have a lot of money. They influence our elected officials to create laws that benefit them. Uh, insurance companies do the same thing. So that's pretty common here in the U.S. But the cost of medicine has been increasing at a rapid rate over the last 10 years, more than 10% year over year, and now up to about 20%. 
an interesting dynamic is now more of the med medicines being prescribed are generics. They're non-branded, so they're generally less costly. So now about 80% of all of the medicines taken in the U.S. are generics. Um, interestingly, the 20% that are uh, name brand are driving about 80% of the medicine spent. So what that tells you is that the new medicines that are coming out are very, very expensive. It's not uncommon for a single medicine for one patient in a year to be in excess of 1 million US dollars. So we've got a major issue coming on the pharmaceutical side uh, without, uh, and you know, many of these are saving lives. So, you know, on one hand, it's so critical, cancer drugs and, and other issues, but uh, we've got to figure out what to do on the pricing with that. Um, you know, uh, with the pandemic, the pandemic in this world has made many changes. One of the areas I'll mention on the pharma is that um, um, it has increased the use and misuse of drugs. And we have a, a rapidly growing portion of our population with drug addictions and the many uh, uh, related deaths and um, healthcare issues that are associated with that. Medical devices. This one I find very interesting, very cool, but uh, you know it's uh, more and more common that our uh, consumers at home will have personal medical devices that's capturing data and will help their clinicians know if they're managing their health issue, often chronic health issues like diabetes and congestive heart failure. And even the smallest of devices like stints that go into your heart uh, or other parts of your body will have chips in them so that uh, we can have radio frequency uh, you know, that monitors what's going on with your health. So medical devices, this market is only gonna grow. Um, next page, this just gives you a visual of who the key players are, the components are in the US healthcare system. And when we get to that, I'll mention. There we go, thank you. Uh, so you've got employers, providers, pharmaceutical life sciences, payers, device vendors, and uh, software vendors. These are the major players that have a hand in the healthcare system today. The employers cover insurance, providers deliver the medicine, the technology, everything that I mentioned to you. A couple of things, you see the logos all the way around this circle. Many, many of these, if not most of them, are clients of ours at Sidious Tech. So we provide them with a large and wide degree of technology support to deliver what it is that they're doing. Now, one thing that's really problematic about these is they're almost all little islands and the need for sharing of data around and among entities within each of those is what has to happen. And it's starting to happen with interoperability and that is um, a very large area for Sidious Tech. It's actually a, a very a strong area, a strength that we bring to many of these customers. And if we go to the next slide, um, post-pandemic era, well, I feel like we're still in the pandemic, certainly with the new Delta variant, but the, the pandemic has created a lot of changes in healthcare and actually in many respects, I think it's good. It's causing change that would not have happened elsewhere. And let me tell you, the health health care industry for a variety of reasons, is just really slow in embracing technology, but the pandemic certainly has put a, a deep pressure on that. And the amount of investment in technology during this pandemic has increased dramatically and that will be sustained. One thing which is not on here on the upper slide, these are um, upward trends, is the use of virtual care. We couldn't go to the doctor's office uh, and we would use you know, our uh, computer, our laptop, our iPad, whatever, to have a visit with a physician. Um, more and more people are realizing the importance of health insurance. So we see that consumption uh, remaining and if not growing. Comorbidities, what that means is, are you a person that has two or more health issues? Um, it's kind of a weird word, but if you have diabetes and you're also morbidly or very badly obese, 
those are two different issues and uh, we have a growing number of people with multiple issues and uh, we need to use technology to help monitor that and manage their conditions. Um, and, you know, people want to have access to information. They want the data and we want to be able to provide it in a very transparent way. What's the cost of services? How can we provide um, an intelligent tool to help consumers understand, you know, what will benefit them? How can they be healthier and, um, you know, reduce their spending? The downward pressure, uh, you know, we're going to see a reduction in the, in the uh, use of inpatient admission. People don't want to go to the hospital now because it's easier to get an infection. We're going to see more care at home, replacing hospital care. We're also going to see a reduction in people, go, uh, the elderly population going into nursing homes. They were afraid. So many people died with the COVID. And I think, you know, people are going to be uh, more likely to stay in their homes longer. Uh, and the last thing I would mention here is that for political reasons and other reasons, there is a big pressure on keeping the rate of price growth down. So pharmaceutical is a good example. The prices were increasing 15, 20% a year. The pressure on the pharmaceutical industry is to keep those trends at a much, much lower level. Uh, so I went through those quickly. I'm going to turn it over to Farouk, and he'll touch on some of the technology drivers here at Sidious sure. Tech. Oh, thanks. thanks, Eric. I think that was very insightful. Uh, Sujay, do let me know in case if I overshoot my time. Uh, so what I'm going to cover today, uh, folks, here is I'm going to talk about the key technology drivers and how they affect the IT industry especially. Uh, the technology landscape itself has been evolving over the last many years, but as I kind of mentioned earlier, is that especially in the last two or three years, uh, we see a lot of them maturing and coming together, you know, and that's really uh, taking the healthcare industry uh, by storm in some ways. Uh, so while healthcare organizations have always been looking at technologies to improve patient care and optimize operations, COVID has really pushed them, you know, to quickly adopt technologies, uh, not only to thrive, but also to survive, you know, because it's become about survival now for them. Now, if you look at the, the screen itself, you know, you'll see that uh, most of the of the trends that you see over here uh, will be familiar to you. So starting from the, from the top left uh, with data science, I think healthcare is one of the biggest adopters of data science uh, in, in the last few years, where every organization, right from hospitals to life sciences to device manufacturers, are now looking at data science as not just as a nice to have, but as a must have to kind of improve the operations, improve patient care. And we are, seeing, we are kind of seeing a, a wide variety of areas, you know, right from early disease detection to automated diagnosis of medical imaging, uh, using deep learning, uh, and uh, even uh, for the matter of uh, uh, identifying uh, challenges much earlier rather than later. Uh, overall, I think data science has actually has really come up in, in the last few years. Now, what does it mean for, 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 for developers and IT professionals? Uh, technically, there are two areas that I actually look into. One is model creation, where you kind of build AI models using tools such as uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, Scikit, Jupyter Notebooks, and whatnot. And the second part is the AI engineering part, where you are embedding the models into your own applications for inferencing and kind of using that model to make, uh, to add value to the customer uh, and the second part of it is is MLOps, which is more to do with, uh, you can think of, of as DevOps for machine learning, where you're kind of operationalizing the entire process of machine learning, right from the training of the models to deployment and retraining uh, in, in production environments, basically. Okay. Uh, we at CTS Tech have a very strong data science uh, practice. Uh, and uh, also for those who are interested, and I, th I think I might have repeated this earlier as well, that CTS Tech has partnered with Bits Pilani, via which you can have a master's program in data science. Uh, this is open for all our employees you know, who are interested in that. Uh, the second part, which is what you see, is the Internet of Medical Things. Now, uh, I IMT, again, IoT has been around for, for a few years, but thanks to uh, cellular, 5, 4G, and 5G coming up, it has really come into, into the mainstream now. Now, thanks to IOMT, uh, we have remote patient monitoring and personalized care, which has become much more feasible then earlier, you know, earlier it would have been just been uh, fictional, but now it's actually out there. So, for example, a very simple example is your smartwatches can now measure heart rate, oxygen, and even in some watches they have they can take an ECG. So, all this data is kind of fed at 
runtime and you can uh, find and you can actually have clinicians telling you uh, whether you know there's an adverse event that might happen soon or not so they can alert and they can take care of those aspects uh, we at serious again have worked in multiple iot projects from your standard wearable devices that you that you wear on your watch uh, on your on your wrist to large dialysis devices you know uh, which is used to identify the patterns and uh, 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 know uh, at what time and at at which stage uh, alerts have been sent have to be sent out now this is both uh, reasons alert is one part of it it's a smaller part but ultimately it's about you more about device data that comes in you actually once the data comes in you actually are doing a lot of analysis on that and that is ultimately leading to uh, to improvement of the patient's care uh, and typically what you've seen is iot tends to use cloud and we have used both azure and aws primarily for these now again from a developer perspective what does it mean uh, when you are uh, writing uh, application for iot you need to handle uh, high volume high velocity transactions in your code it has to be secure it has to be really fast uh, and at times you'll also have to leverage machine learning or or rule engines to make decisions at run time okay uh, this makes this basically means that you'll need to use most of the times you'll need to use cloud or uh, or or specific iot uh, frameworks uh, and as also special as no sql databases like time series databases or multi model databases Uh, for automation testers out there, uh, this is a completely different field of testing, which will require its own set of strategies and tools. You know, which is going to be different from your Selenium uh, uh, areas. You know, as as such. Uh, the next area that that is out there is is cloud, and I'm I'm pretty sure everyone is kind of is aware, and this is uh, very well known. But cloud adoption has literally zoomed in the last few years for us. You know, so. Uh, pharma companies uh, life sciences companies uh, have always been earlier adopters of cloud and they have been using it for a very long time but now we are seeing a lot of hospitals and even insurance companies adopting cloud rapidly uh, it's is primarily not only to help optimize the cost but also is providing infinite scale for organizations you know so what eric mentioned that uh, a lot of hospitals a lot of insurance companies are now adopting uh, uh, technology rapidly and the most critical element for that is cloud because all the digital transformation is actually being hosted on cloud now for you and in my mind it's a must for if you want to have telehealth ai iot uh, you, you you perhaps cannot do without cloud in in my mind uh, at cities tech we work across all the three major clouds uh, uh, Azure, AWS, and GCP, and a large percentage of our projects happen to happen to leverage cloud in some way or the other across web technologies, across microservices, mobile apps, AI, big data, data warehouse, those areas basically. Uh, from a for software professionals out there, I'll highly recommend that you should be comfortable with at least one cloud, Azure, AWS, or GCP, uh, but at least have one under your belt. Uh, it's it's for both developers as well as for uh, for quality assurance folks out there. Uh, and while you're learning uh, cloud, uh, at least for, especially for the developers, I will, uh, I will also recommend to learn Docker, Kubernetes, and serverless technologies because soon cloud native is going to be future. In fact, it's it's already out there. It's it's the present right now. Okay. Uh, the fourth area that you see on the on the, on the bottom is telehealth. Now, telehealth is an area which was available for a while. But really kicked off, you know, last year via mobile apps. So mobile apps have become very common. Uh, mobile apps have, 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 of course, have been common in the past. But now uh, more and more doctor consultations are done via video calls uh, in the US. In India, we have apps like Plakto that you might have seen, uh, which actually do that. Uh, it has really democratized the entire, you know, uh, the the medical industry uh, in in some ways, I would say, because now people who are remote can just connect with any any doctor, any physician. Across the globe, uh, and actually can 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 connect and get and get things done. Uh, the next obvious one is is chatbots. Uh, chatbots are another area which has become very mainstream uh, for symptom checking, appointment scheduling, and whatnot. In India, you must have seen uh, the COVID vaccinations, where to get it, and all those things. Those are also driven by chatbots. Uh, from a developer's perspective, what do you need to do? You might need. To, uh, there are many de developer frameworks out there, such as uh, Microsoft Bot Framework. Google's dialog flow Amazon Lex so one you can you can pick one of these you know to kind of build out your own uh, chatbots uh, and of course there are many many other frameworks out there i'm just kind of naming a few of them uh, the fifth area is what eric kind of alluded to earlier was interoperability so in india what we tend to do we tend to carry our records or medical records from one doctor to other doctor from hospital to hospital but in the us it's largely where organizations want to exchange information with each other 
uh, of course it depends upon the patient consent uh, which is which is very critical uh, but it happens as electronically uh, so interoperably interop in this case basically deals with exchange of patient data across different organizations across different systems uh and the most popular and, and recent option that that uh, organizations are adopting at this moment is something called fire which is uh, which is a rest api uh, which is used to exchange patient data so uh so in that case you are actually are thinking about microservices apis uh fire data stores uh, json and uh, a different database uh, format in some ways uh ct stack as as uh, eric alluded earlier was we have a very large interop practice and we have our own product called fast plus that is actually gaining a lot of popularity uh, in, in the us healthcare uh, and the last one is big data analytics now in layman's term this is a combination of big data processing data warehouse data visualization the primary goal of this uh, uh, feature is basically to, to ensure that it improves your decision making and improves the patient care in the long run you know uh, it is useful for predicting trends and ultimately enables risk and disease management in some ways uh, again from a developer's perspective what does it mean it's a uh, uh, the technology stack is a combination of spark kafka snowflake redshift bigquery uh, azure synapse uh, and from a visualization perspective you can think about tableau looker and those kind of tools okay so with that i come to the end of my own technology overload to you and i'll pass it back to eric to kind of cover the the future growth potential of of ct stack eric back to you all right take it off mute and that was great for a quick question though i i heard uh, a special amount of passion from you on your points around the cloud and i know the health insurance healthcare industry for reasons of hipaa and privacy that has been a struggle but where do you see cloud being used most okay so that that's a good question actually and uh, thanks for that uh, i happen to be a cloud practice lead in the past so that's the reason why that's a very popular question for me uh, healthcare industry especially uh, as i said earlier that i've seen a lot of that happening in the pharma space the life sciences who used to use it a lot but more and more i'm seeing a lot of adoption in uh, in healthcare in, in the healthcare insurance sector especially where they using it for ai they using it for data analytics and mainly for the big data processing because they get uh, millions of of claims that come in every day and they want to process them in real time uh, really fast i won't say real time but in in a short span of time uh, and typically that's an area where we are seeing a lot of cloud but the major area we are seeing cloud is is ai so what happens uh, at times is that Uh, especially with medical the, the data sets up very large and to kind of train your models you require really high end infrastructure if you have to do that on your on prem servers you'll have to have really uh, spend a lot of money the capital expenditure is going to be really high whereas if you go to go to cloud is pay as you go you use it for a short amount of time get your ai apna iot is another example where we are seeing a lot of traction with cloud because again it requires a large scale for that So I think that's that's a very short answer for your for your question. No, that's good. That was helpful. And you know, one thing uh, here's a, a quick story for everyone on on this webinar um, on the subject of interoperability. Um, in let me use an example in Minneapolis, Minnesota. There's three major health systems there, and a health system is a combination of physicians, hospitals. They even have some pharmacies. uh they have diagnostic laboratories and radiology for x-rays and mris and these three health systems um all are on one um uh brand of electronic medical record called epic epic is really the big one in the united states so they're all on epic and when i talked with the ceo of one of the health systems i said this must be great because you can share information about your patient and she says no er we've re- we've made changes to our systems modified them for our own health system uh but we can't talk to each other even though we're all on the same EMR and so this is an issue uh that i would say to you why we one of the reasons why we spend so much money on healthcare i may go to the hospital uh for an emergency room visit or an inpatient visit and that hospital may be part of a different health system that i belong to but they cannot access my medical records they cannot get my medical information in the labs that i've had so they're duplicating efforts and uh, in the last year or two the federal government 
has set out regulations that now is requiring insurance companies and health systems to talk to one another and create greater degrees of interoperability. This is good. It's long overdue. And we at Cities Tech fit in that really beautifully. Uh, as Farouk mentioned, uh, I think we have uh, the largest number of HL7 um, certified uh, engineers uh, in the world in a single yes. company. So uh, let me end with this slide here, and I'm not going to go into all the numbers, but what this is intending to show you here at Cities Tech is that we have grown rapidly in the past. I will tell you right now, we are a $300 million company, and we've already surpassed our goal for fiscal year 21-22. And in the past decade, we've grown at 20 to 25% per year. So these are numbers, these are year-over-year -year increases that we've achieved. Uh, when we think about our growth for the uh, coming decade, through organic and through acquisition, we expect to uh, reach um, uh, 500 million in a very short period of time, in about three years or so, we're at 300 million, as I mentioned, and revenues reaching a billion dollars um, by, and I, I would fully expect it to be before fiscal year 29-30. So it's a, a company that you're joining that is growing rapidly. It's a company that is highly focused in an area of in an industry that is growing rapidly, as you heard from Farouk and me. And it's also a company that, in my view, and I know in many, it's a great place to work. We've seen the awards uh, for being a great place to work over the years. And that's important. That's important to all of us. So um, I, I know on behalf of Farouk and all of my colleagues at Sidious Tech, I just want to uh, welcome you and congratulate you on your selection as Sidious Tech as your next uh, stop in your professional portfolio and uh, can't wait to have you join and officially welcome you as a citizen, as we call uh, each of our employees that are part of Sidious Tech citizens. Uh, but I hope you found this useful um, and exciting at the same time.